Well, thank you so much for inviting me here. It's good to be with you. I, uh, I get to travel around a number of churches, and I do love it. I still love it. And uh, actually, if I'm, don't tell them this, but if I'm stuck at St. Leonard's too long, I feel like I need to travel again. So uh, <laughs> I love that church up there. Um, when I was archdeacon and traveling all over the place around here, I did, I did 35,000 miles in East Devon a year in the car as archdeacon. That was another reason for giving up the job, really, doing all that driving around the lanes. But, uh, uh, but my wife was thoroughly settled at St. Leonard's, and so it was a place where in retirement we liked Exeter and we decided that we would come back here. Uh, so a different, number of different churches I've visited over the time, and I'm sure like most of you, I, I have my own preferences of styles of worship, and sometimes you go to a church and you think, hmm, that ain't me. <laughs> um, but it's God's people. And... Uh, I have my own uh, preferences for uh, styles of music. I have preferences. I have all my own preferences, as I'm sure you do. You know, you, you go to, you're on holiday and you go to another church and you say, well, that was all right, but I do like my home church. And uh, I think one of the wonderful things of traveling a bit around the world and going to church in different places is you begin to have a better understanding of God's people rather than the sort of fairly superficial things we often think of. Now, I'm talking about people who are converted and churches full of converted people. I'm not talking about, you know, those churches which have a, a veneer of the faith but are not really in the faith. But wherever you go where, in a place like this, the gospel is taught, then you see God at work, whatever it is. And styles can be very different. I assure you, styles in South America and Africa, uh, where I, until COVID, I was in both, in both, in, uh, both continents for uh, the previous year for some weeks. Uh, the styles are incredibly different, incredibly different, you know. And, and by the way, services are a whole lot longer. So I, I'm going to take the liberty, and it'll be about an hour and a half if you're setting your car. <laughs> That's another thing, isn't it, with style? I, I was speaking to a Portuguese friend the other day, and he said to me, he said, I just don't get these short services you have in England. He said, you know, we, we, we start off with some hymns, but we'll sing for about an hour, and then we'll preach for about an hour and a half, and then we'll stop and have some coffee, and then we'll get back together again for a second sermon. And, uh, and then we'll have lunch together, and that's our Sunday. So life is different in different places, isn't it? It's a joy, and it's humbling to see... God's people worshipping in so many different ways. But let me suggest this. In a world that is desperate, most of your friends are desperate in one way or another to be loved and to have a certain glory in the world, whether it's through their wealth or through their family or through their job or whatever it happens to be, I want to suggest that you as a church have both those things that you have glory, and that you are loved, much loved. In about eight weeks' time, I said, I'll be traveling again to teach. One of my favorite things to do is not just the teaching in seminaries, uh, which, which I do love, and uh, it's lovely to be in front of uh, lots of young people who are going into the ministry all over South America, but, uh, but actually what I like to do on the Sundays is I asked to go and teach, to, to preach in some of the tiny churches in the hills, in the poor areas round. I go to Medellin, for example, in Colombia, uh, and to teach in the tiny churches up in the hills in the very poor areas. And, and I like to do that partly because I know that the young faithful ministers in those churches never imagined that they would ever get an invited speaker to come to them because in their eyes, their church is too small. It's only the big churches down in the town center that are going to get the visitors and so on. But I love going. And I love seeing people who are struggling in every human way imaginable, who are worshiping. Sometimes in churches where there's a, a minister who barely has enough money to do, you know, to where he doesn't live any better than the surrounding population. And uh, there he is, faithfully preaching the gospel, maybe to a dozen, maybe to two dozen uh, people. 
I love going into churches like that. About three years ago, I was preaching in just such a poor area in Uganda. And the church probably had about 50 people with their children worshipping. And at the end, the pastor invited me to stay and have lunch with him and three of the elders. And uh, we stayed in the church building, and there was a very small little church office. It was certainly, if you know the one here, it was certainly no bigger than the one just out here. Um, and, uh, and we were presented by a woman in the church with, three, with, with four plates, and the plates had rice on them. And in the middle of the plate was, uh, of my plate, was a little bit of, um, a little bit of bone with about, about one mouthful of meat on it. And that, that was the lunch. And when I, uh, <laughs> one, of the great, one of the great gifts that uh, I think all ministers need is to be able to eat anything, right? Because it can be so rude if you don't. But I was sitting there eating, and I suddenly realized, as obviously I had to pick the bone up in my fingers and so on, I suddenly realized the others didn't have that. And uh, I spoke to one of my friends who uh, was a missionary in the area, and she said to me, she said, well, Paul, you've got to realize they went out specially to buy that piece of meat for you. They that minister could not possibly have afforded that. His church will have put some money together so they could have that little bit of meat in your rice because you were the privileged guest. And you look at that church and you think to yourself, glory? Glory for the people of God? Really? Humanly speaking, there's no glory. Humanly speaking, they had nothing. And yet what we find as we come to John 17 is that as God's people, Christ has given us glory and showed us that we are wonderfully loved. Now, I think you all know John 17 pretty well probably if you've been Christians for a while. It's that famous chapter where Jesus himself can be heard praying to his heavenly father. And, uh, and, and really the first part of that, uh, of that passage is, is Jesus just a personal prayer to the Father. But we know it very often, don't we, because it's a prayer for unity in the church. I was so thrilled to hear the testimonies. What was it, about three people, I think, at some stage or other have mentioned unity in this church already in the service this morning. And we know this chapter because it's where Christ prays that they may be one as we are one, the Heavenly Father and Him, in order that the world may know. It's not just because it's nice to be all at one and unified, of course. It's in order that the world may know that you have sent me and so on. So we know the passage from that, uh, that point of view very well. Uh, and as I say, it starts out with this sort of very personal prayer. Let me just read it from verse 1. Father, the time has come, glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. And, and there's that uh, private prayer. This is the Lord saying, do this to me, help me to do this for you. And, and it's, it's sort of almost like we're left out. We're just bystanders listening. And yet, though in some ways this prayer is intensely private, it is public. Look at verse 13. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they, that's the disciples, but it's also, as Jesus makes clear in this prayer, you and me, those who have believed in the disciples' message years on, so that they may have the full me measure of my joy within them. Jesus wanted us to hear his prayer because he knew the comfort that we would receive 
from listening to it. He knew the joy that would be ours when we listened in. So we know from this passage, Christ desires our unity. We know he wants to share our joy. We know as he prays, he's about to return to glory. But on your anniversary today, I want you to be especially encouraged by just two points that Jesus makes in this prayer that we can easily miss. We do have glory and we are loved. So look then first at verse 22. I have given them the glory <coughs> that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. Now look around at God's church here. I, I hope most of you, unless you're visiting, you can look around and hopefully you can say, I know those people and I love them. If you can't, speak to me afterwards because we need to have a prayer together, all right? <laughs> but when you look around, do you honestly feel, oh my word, the glory of this place? Now, there may be times when you do. But let's be honest, most of us, when we look at our churches, don't quite see that, do we? We don't quite see that we have glory, whatever it is that Christ is talking about here, that we have glory. We don't feel like that. If you were that church in Uganda that I've just talked about, I don't think you would feel we have glory. Not easily, anyway. On the other hand, you might look at one of the big churches like Tim Keller's in New York, which you might be able to see on TV in Uganda, and you might say, that's glory. You see? Because that's judging things with human eyes. That's a huge evangelical church preaching the gospel week by week and hundreds come to church. And, and, and you might look at that and say, oh yeah, well I can see glory in some parts of God's church. I can't see it in mine. can't see it up in the little shanty towns above Medellin. Can't see God's glory. And yet Jesus says, I've given them the glory that you gave me. Glory? So what is this? Well, look back at verse 1. Jesus looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. The time has come. This is what Jesus has come to earth for. This was to be his glory. Verse 4, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, through this prayer, Jesus is looking forward through the crucifixion. That has yet to come, but he's looking forward through that. Okay, And he says, I have brought you glory by completing the work you gave me to do. Jesus' glory lay in his full obedience to the Father which meant it lay in, the f in following the way of the cross, in following the way of the cross and suffering. His great glory on the cross would, verse 2 tells us, bring eternal life to believers, to people like you and me. It was the route via the cross that leads eventually to the ascension and the glorification or the confirmation of Christ's glory once again at the right hand of the heavenly father. And Jesus says, verse 22, that he's given his people, you and me, his glory that the father has given him. What an extraordinary thought that is. So that's the glory, but how does he give it to us? Well, in two ways. First, surely, as we behold again the cross, as we look at the cross, as we trust in his amazing completed work for us, who died, he who died once and for all on the cross, how that should cause us to worship, to lift our eyes and say, thank you, thank you, Lord, encouraged by that lifting of our eyes to the cross to worship but also encouraged to love and to service of the Lord, to follow in our master's footsteps. For it is there through faith, the faith we walk by, that we are incorporated into him and he in us. Look again at verses 22 and 23. I've given them the glory that you gave me, 
that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. But what we often miss, I think, as we share this glory as, as well, is that we share it in our calling. It isn't just that through faith we, as it were, participate uh, in the death of Christ and what Christ himself says is my glory. You remember the Apostle Paul says that in a beautiful way, doesn't it? He, he says, I have died with Christ. That's what we're talking about here. But it isn't just that we share Christ's glory in that way through our faith. It is also that we share his glory in our calling. And this is where it gets hard. For Jesus has called us to follow him in the way of suffering, the way of the cross, for the sake of the gospel. It may look weird and strange to the world around as people give themselves to serving Christ and speaking out for him. But therein lies the glory that Jesus has given us. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all carry these words of Jesus. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This is really, I imagine for you as it is for me, really hard to grasp. As a church, you do and will no doubt face many trials and difficulties, sometimes from within and certainly from without. And we need to examine our perspective here. Like Christ, we endure hardships and enmity. Like Christ, much of our Christian life as a church, but also as individuals, will resemble more the suffering servant than the ascended Christ. But Christ saw that very suffering itself, even the cross, as his glory, for it was followed in obedience to the Father's will. You see, we need to see the way of the cross, not as something to be avoided, not as something that makes us say, well, I've accomplished nothing today. Not as something that gives us permission to criticize everybody else. But rather as our glory. It is an honor to serve God and to suffer for him and to take up our cross when that is what we're asked to do. And that is how we also share in the glory of Christ. I've given them my glory now. He doesn't say, though it is true and elsewhere in the scriptures we read this, that one day we will be glorified with him and everybody will see our glory. For now that glory is as covered in us as it was in Christ on the cross. It's not there for everybody to see and that's why it's hard for us. That's why it's hard for us. Because we live in a world which says, you need money, you need fame. Your church will only really show glory if it's got hundreds coming to it, or if it's got the best musicians in the world, or it's got this, or it's on television every week, or whatever, right? Because we've absorbed so easily the ways of the world. And Christ says, well, no. No. The way of the glory I'm talking about, your glory, will be found in being obedient to the Father. And that will inevitably mean struggles and trials and sufferings in this age before eventually that glory is not given to you for the first time when you are raised from the dead forever. It is visible in you in a new way in the resurrected body. It's not that you don't have it now. But one day it will be fully visible and you will be like Christ, as scripture tells us elsewhere. But not right now. And while Christians, I think, in England can overstate this sometimes, I would say that it is getting harder to be a Christian in England at the moment. 
And, and especially, I think that's true for our younger generations, speaking as one of the oldies. I think just watching what uh, not just school teenagers have to go through, but, I, but I'm thinking of people in business in their 20s and in their uh, early 30s. I think they're living through a very difficult time where it's exceedingly hard for all sorts of reasons to be a Christian. I don't want to overstate that because there have been times in English history when it's been an awful lot worse. But we need to recognize that that's going on. And so we need a teaching of glory <laughs> that is biblical, don't we? And it's going to be hugely challenging to those of us who've grown up with all the ambitions that are set before us this day and age. I worry sometimes when Christian parents seem to come over to their children as wanting academic achievement and wanting money and wanting a good marriage and all these things for their children more than they seem to want. That those children will grow up knowing and loving the Lord and maybe end up working in Uganda or somewhere. <laughs> this is the pressure that's on us. Can we see among ourselves, the world won't see it yet, but can we see among ourselves the glory of the calling that we have been given. Church life is never easy. Churches are filled with sinful people. If you don't think so, just look at yourself. Forgiven and loved, and yet we still mess it up, don't we? I remember when I was, uh, uh, I was working in uh, Cambridge when I first graduated from college, and uh, I wanted to go and do my theological training in America, and my minister, lovely, lovely man, um, said it like it, you know, always talk like it is, you know, just really, just straight out. No pastoral sensitivity, really, he just said it. And, uh, and on one occasion, he was, he was absolutely convinced that I was going to America because I was seeking out the perfect church and I didn't like his church and all the rest of it, right, to, to do my studies. And so he said to me, he said, Paul, he said, you do realize, don't you, that when you find the perfect church, it will no longer be the perfect church because you're there. <laughs> right? <laughs> and of course we, we, we know, don't we, that that is so true. There's, there's no uh, perfect church. Churches are messy places. Churches are filled with sinners, loved and forgiven, but we struggle sometimes. And in this chapter, Christ prays for us, doesn't he? He pleads with the Father that the Father will protect us, that, and he will protect us, the ones for whom he is about to die, and that he will bring us unity, the unity the Father knows with the Son, and so on. And he says, this is joy, isn't it? Look at verse 13 again. I say these things while I'm still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. So our eyes need to be focused on the cross. Uh, some of you who are older will know the lovely hymn by Elizabeth Plathane. Beneath the cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand. I take, O cross, thy shadow for my abiding place. I ask no other sunshine than the sunshine of thy face, content to let the world go by, to know no gain or loss, my sinful self, my only shame, my glory all, the cross. I love those words. They're old-fashioned now, but they carry such a wonderful truth. And the result of being given this sort of glory and thinking in this way, verse 22, is that they may be one as we are one. Secondly, just very briefly, by way of encouragement for you in your anniversary, God's love has been revealed in his church. God's love has been revealed in his church. Look at the end of the prayer in verse 26. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. The love you have for me may be in them. This is an amazing statement. Of course, we can take it personally. The love that he has for the son, he has for me personally. The scriptures say that in many places. But here I think Jesus is especially saying, in the church, in his people. It's an amazing statement. When we talk about our faith, we quite rightly talk about how we love the Lord, don't we? You know, if you have membership in a church, one of the questions you sometimes ask of people uh, if they're coming into membership is, do you know and love the Lord? 
basic question. And people say, yes, I love the Lord. Yet here, Jesus reminds us again that this love starts not with us. This love starts with God himself. And it's brought to us through the work of Jesus as he calls us to himself and dies for us and enables us to know and experience the same love, he says here, the same love of the Father that he himself knows. And this idea is at the same time surely wonderfully encouraging and yet very humbling, isn't it? It's really humbling. It reminds us that the very existence of this church here in its anniversary day, the very existence of us as Christians depends entirely on the love of the Father mediated to us through the Son, especially as he died on the cross. Lest we're ever tempted to say we're strong Christians because we love God or this church came into being because certain wonderful people loved the Lord so much they wanted to build it, Jesus reminds us that our one true joy and encouragement as a church depends not on us but on God's own love and grace by which he draws us into that relationship with him. He draws us into the church, into the body of his people. Earlier we read from Deuteronomy 7. And, and God was having to make this same point to the Israelites as he makes in the New Testament in various ways to us. Listen again to words from verse 6 and part of verse 7. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other people. For you were the fewest of all peoples. And he might say, he didn't choose you because you were very faithful. He didn't choose you because you had lots of money. He didn't choose you because you were sensible enough to come out of Iraq and come down to Palestine. He did it because, or as he says here, but it was because the Lord loved you. The Lord loved you. Jesus says he's made known to his people and will continue to reveal God so that his love will be known and experienced by them all. And of course that takes us right back to where we started. It takes us back to the cross, doesn't it? Because where else do we see so clearly the love of God? We see it in Jesus receiving his glory by dying on the cross for us. One John, the same writer, I think, one John four verses nine and ten, we read this. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So let's reflect this morning, not on the difficulties you're bound to have seen over the years in this church and in your own life, of course, not on the places where you've failed, but reflect that you exist as God's people here in Exmouth simply because God has loved you, simply because God has loved you. And he's loved you with a love deeper than we can ever imagine. A love we never have deserved and never can deserve. A love expressed through his amazing electing grace as Christ died for us. In the midst of Christ's glory in his death on the cross. A glory that we share and that he has given us. In the midst of that looking at the cross so we see the depth of the love with which we are loved. This was Jesus' goal, he says, to bring us to the glory that he has. And he's done it. One day we will see it. One day we will see it in glory. I can't wait for that time. But right now, we need to hear again. We already have glory and we are already loved. And 
so much would the world long to have those two things. And so often they look in the wrong places. And Jesus in his prayer has that in mind too. For he says when they reveal this glory and when they show that they are loved and they behave as one as they should, then the world will know. And the world will be attracted. Let's rejoice in what God's given us in this anniversary Sunday. We'll pray. Father, we thank you for your word and its encouragement and its joy. And we thank you above all that Christ died for us. May we face the task ahead of us, knowing that in your grace and your love, we have already received glory. Lord, we look forward to that great day when with all your people we shall be raised from the dead and we shall see that glory visibly in our faces and reflect clearly the image of Christ. But for now, we ask that by your spirit, you will help us live for you. In Jesus' name, amen.